members who are here for our last meeting at RMATA. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause for hanging in. Woo! All right. Um, quick reminder, make sure you do your evaluations for the speakers in your app on your phone. And if you want the CEU credits, you have to do the quiz and submit it. So make sure you're doing those things as well. It is my pleasure to announce our next speaker and our last speaker, again, Brave Soul. Dr. Wells, Aaron Wells, is an associate professor of exercise science at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. He's also the clinical coordinator for their athletic training program at BYU. He's published and prevented, presented in a variety of professional settings and seminars on modalities used, treatment of musculoskeletal injuries, and numerous studies on the outcomes and efficacy of photobiomodulation. One of my favorite words. All right. Prior to joining BYU, Dr. Wells served as an adjunct faculty adjunct faculty at Utah Valley University and an athletic trainer for the Los Angeles Angels baseball team for many years. While working with the Angels, in addition to modalities research, he developed mechanisms through which the Angels evaluated pitchers upon reporting for their season to determine injury probability as well as needs for specific shoulder range of motion increases. He and his wife Tiffany have four children and reside in Cedar Hills, Utah. Dr. Aaron Wells. So this is kind of a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a bucket list, but being the last speaker at a presentation, at a symposium, I was wondering what it was like. So I, I am glad to experience that, and I appreciate those of you that are here that are either local or just couldn't get an earlier flight. So um, thank you for being here. I also I need to mention, um, yes, I do have my four kids and Tiffany, but we, we added a dog. Um, so I don't want to, I need to add Lilo um, to, our, to our family thing. The kids think I love Lilo more than them and they're perceptive that way because, yes, uh, that, that is the case. Um, I, I also want to mention one thing uh, about uh, being able to come to RMATA. I know we've had a lot of people talk about how uh, it is great to be in person, and I'm one of those people that I do enjoy being in person, but I really do. Like, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak and, and, uh, uh, and their acceptance of, of me being able to share some ideas today. Um, but Albuquerque particularly, I grew up just a few hours from here uh, over in, in Texas, um, but uh, just, uh, just right off I-40 in the panhandle of Texas. And there um, is a fast food restaurant uh, that is there and as well is here in Albuquerque uh, called Taco Cabana. Um, anytime we come to Albuquerque for RMATA, I, am a f I frequent Taco Cabana. I lived in Italy for two years when I was 19, uh, Central Italy, uh, and, I, I, and I was there for two years straight without coming home. Um, I got home at midnight, and at 1.30 a.m., um, I was at Taco Cabana. So uh, it is uh, it's very great. And, and yes, I, I actually did four meals over the last four days at Taco Cabana. So I, I really enjoy being here in Albuquerque for more than just that. But um, I want to talk just a bit today, and I know, again, we're the, I'm the last speaker, so I try to be as, um, as entertaining as I possibly can. Let me make sure I go the right way here. There we go. I always like to begin, um, and I oftentimes will begin my classes this way, with just some type of a, a little thought. I came across this the other day, and I just thought it was really cool. Um, this gentleman, a uh, uh, former military gentleman, says, people ask how I stay so positive after losing my legs. I simply ask how they stay so negative with theirs. I'm just a real big believer in attitude is everything, and it's a lot easier said than done. But again, I, I think our attitude is just... Um, uh, such an important thing, and I try to have as positive an attitude as I, as I possibly can. Certainly, I need to, to improve in lots of areas. Um, my goal today is just to present a few ideas about um, photobiomodulation or PBM. Right? You say photobiomodulation because you want to sound you know, smarter, which we all want to, but PBM is what that is. Um, and essentially, it's light and laser. Right? So um, I'm going to you know, share my ideas and uh, hopefully trigger a few emotions. That's why I have the inside out thing. I'm also a real big Disney person. My main dog's name is Lilo from Lilo and Stitch. So um, I, uh, you know, I'm a real big um, Disney person, and, and so it, my, my hope is that I trigger some things in your mind. Um, I might upset some of you. Um, I might, you know, make some of you really happy. I, you know, as long as I'm getting you to think that's really what, I, what I'm hoping. Um, I, I want you to analyze and really, again, think for yourself and talk about where we can go from here. I do have a couple of disclaimers. First is the, the equipment for the primary study um, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, was provided by Careware. Uh, I am not an employee of Careware. I don't have stock in their company or anything of that nature. Um, you know, but I, I do want to mention that they were the ones that funded, excuse me, they were the ones that provided, I beg your pardon, um, the, uh, the equipment. And then we funded it through other uh, paying subjects and such through other entities through BYU. 
So when I, when I first started looking at, at light therapy, um, it, it, it really started in a couple areas. I, I love going to the trade show at, at, uh, at NATA, as well as here. Um, but I like, the, you know, the, the trade show is really fun for me to kind of see all the different products. And uh, the talk earlier, I can't remember when it was, yesterday morning about the, you know, gizmos and gadgets and all the different things that are out there that, that we have to choose between. Um, this was one of the ones that I saw and I was kind of interested and intrigued in. And I had a relationship um, with the founders of Careware uh, doing some work for them, well not, doing some studies for them regarding some of their ultrasound equipment. So that's how the relationship started and, uh, uh, and I wanted to basically kind of see if, you know, this does anything. Um, you know, it, it, or is it just the latest and greatest, right? Because that's what we have to do is we have to decide, you know, is this, is this really vogue or is it really, you know, here to stay? You know, is it, is it justified, right, using this? Um, one of the, one of the uh, latest and greatest, and, and I, I kind of make fun of this tongue in cheek, I don't mean to, because I actually want to try it, um, is something, this has nothing to do with light, but this is an example of what I mean by some of the latest and greatest, is a sensory deprivation tank, right, it's called an isolation or a flotation tank. Um, this is one of the things, I, I got to speak at PBATS a few years ago, um, professional baseball athletic trainers meeting, uh, and they actually had, it was for the major league staff only, so they had some really nice equipment there and uh, you know from different vendors and one of them was this tank that you just put in there and I guess you fill it with salt and water and um, it's supposed to really enhance your relaxation which can you know assist in recovery and they were saying all these different things and I thought you know I don't know I, ju I just thought is that is that really doing anything or is it the latest and the greatest so you know sometimes yeah we, we, we hear these things and we wonder if they're really good or, or, or not so I started to think a little bit about light therapy and I thought well I think there's something to this right I mean if you think about how light uh, you know, is utilized and has been utilized for a long time. Uh, think about just our natural sunlight, right? What that does to help release vitamin D. You know, how do you feel on a rainy day versus sunny day? Have you ever, you know, been kind of tired sitting at your desk? A great idea if it's a sunny day is to walk outside and get some fresh air. And without question, the fresh air and the movement of oxygen and your muscles, that's going to activate your brain. But there's also a component to having, you know, sun on our, on our bodies, right? So, so forever light has been utilized to, to basically kind of help treat and and um, promote things within our tissues so I, I, again I don't think that it was you know reinventing the wheel here like thinking about light it, it's been around for a while traditionally it's been used to um, uh, uh, work with infection in fact there's a, a company I was I was looking up recently just trying to see some other areas of light use and a company called Sterilaser Again, pun intended, sterilizer, sterilizer, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, they actually uh, have light equipment uh, that they say, you know, you can hook into a, like a high school wrestling room. So at night, you can actually shine that green light and it will kill the bacteria on the mats. And um, we know that we use light, you know, for plenty of uh, hospital equipment and other surgical equipment. Um, so uh, in fact, Careware, uh, including as well as Sterilizer, um, is actually doing studies where they look at um, eliminating COVID-19, right? Uh, obviously not once it's infected, but on topical surfaces and such. Uh, and they've had pretty good success with it. So uh, again, um, it's always been there, right? And we've used it for, for some of these skin conditions and some of these infections. Um, but we wanted to really kind of look at it and see if there was a, a component to muscular recovery. And, and the, re the main reason that that started was really looking at what the different types of light does, or different types of light do, excuse me. Um, green light, again, is primarily utilized for bacteria. Uh, red light, uh, it, really interestingly, you post uh, LED red light, um, it largely affects mitochondria, uh, and it can uh, increase ATP production in mitochondria. So it's more of, a, uh, of a, uh, an energizer, if you will. Um, blue light is really good for uh, tissue recovery and for inflammation. I mean, both of them affect inflammation, um, but blue light is really specifically um, uh, helping with the release of nitric oxide, which is a pretty potent vasodilator. Um, you know, it uh, again assists in the recovery and the inflammatory response once we have an injury. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the studies that I did where we used both lights and then one light. Um, we actually did a study, uh, well, I, we, we did some pilot work uh, using blue light only, and, and the, the results were really fascinating. Um, uh, just again, before we start talking about some of the studies, just as kind of some, some of the history in the background, you know, we know that we use light therapy and laser for scar tissue, for, you know, just general recovery, for, you know, edema, um, pain modulation, and when we think about, you know, the different types of, uh, uh, of 
medications and other things were used for pain modulation when we went over in an opioid crisis. So anything that can really um, assist people in finding healthier ways to, to cope with their pain, I think, is a very good thing. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have found uh, uh, utilizing light to be a, a real good um, uh, assistant in helping people, you know, handle their pain, basically. Um, you know, can it be used effectively uh, or as effectively as some other, you know, traditional treatments? So can it be more effective? That's some of the stuff that I'm looking at, and that's some of the stuff that I personally have studied and then also kind of looked at some research studies. So one of the first things I did with, um, with light was a few years ago, I conducted a study where we simply wanted to look and see if we could uh, increase uh, blood flow into the area where the light was being placed. So we... Um, uh, again, you see the objective is we were seeing if we could get heating, which again is blood flow, bringing oxygen to the tissue right where the light was placed. So we took 10 healthy subjects, right? We um, uh, used it and put it on the posterior calf. We cleaned it. Uh, we inserted or I inserted a thermocouple. Now it was very superficial. And I get that 0.5 centimeters is very superficial, but it was still, um, you know, in the sub-Q area. Uh, and then we actually did one on the skin as well um, uh, where the light was. And then we did one that was three centimeters away. So again, we wanted to see if there was superficial increase um, and, if, and if there was actual increase within the intramuscular, excuse me, within the uh, subcutaneous tissue. But then we we also put the one probe about three centimeters away just to see if the light was actually doing anything, right? If, it, you know, if that area was the area that we were going to see heating. Um, again, all, all the thermocouples were interfaced with an isothermics uh, electrothermometer. My hands keep slipping off this, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, again, we did a 15-minute photobiomodulation treatment, and then we uh, also looked at the rate of decay um, for five minutes once the treatment was over. And there's just a picture you can kind of see of what the light patch looks like. Um, what, what's kind of cool is uh, this was, again, a few years ago. Uh, and I don't know if you can tell, but the little round circle, I know the screens are kind of dark, but the little round circle um, that is holding the casing um, is actually a Martinelli's bottle cap. Um, that's what they put the casing, or that's what we put the casing in in order to help trigger the light patch. It, again, this was kind of prototype stuff. Um, and it was really, that literally is that little white thing is a Martinelli's bottle cap. Now, they've advanced, you know, since then, but that was, again, one of the prototypes, kind of fun to, to, to see that and be part of that process. Um, we did a repeated measure of ANOVA um, to look at the difference between the area underneath the light patch and then the area uh, where it was just adjacent to the light patch. Um, the light patch increased sub -Q tissue, and again, it's only 0.5 centimeters, so I, I get that I'm not saying this is better than a heat pack, which, you know, maybe gets up to two centimeters or certainly not ultrasound, which can, depending upon the, you know, the, the frequency um, and the intensity, obviously, uh, can get up to maybe, you know, four to five centimeters, depending, again, upon the machine that you're using. But we still saw an increase, right? We saw, you know, a, a six-degree increase um, in some subjects. Uh, the light patch increased skin temperature almost eight degrees, right? So we felt like we were getting a pretty significant increase in blood flow, which is what we would expect, right, based upon what blue light and red light are, are, are you know, advocating for what they're saying they're doing. Um, and then interestingly enough, just away from the light patch, again, three centimeters, not far, um, we actually saw a decrease in temperature, right? And sometimes you see that, obviously, when your subject comes in, you know, they've been walking, they've been out in the sun, their muscles are, you know, firing, they're, you know, delivering blood flow. And then when they lie down, obviously that stops. And so it was very clear to us that we were activating, you know, right where the light patch was, okay? Um, uh, another uh, study that, uh, that, we, that we looked at was a systematic review by uh, Leal Jr. et al. They looked at 10 out of 13 studies using photobiomodulation um, with red light and infrared light prior to exercise. 10 out of 13 studies uh, had positive outcomes. And so we actually performed, I say we, part of our research group, this was actually Justin Rigby, who's at University of Utah. When he was down in Texas, um, they did a study where they looked at uh, biceps fatigue. Uh, they had um, uh, subjects that were performing um, uh, biceps curls, uh, and uh, then they would rest them, treat them with light, and then have them do uh, as many as they could do. Now, there were some limitations to this study. We didn't use a sham, or they didn't use a sham group. So, you know, I understand that's a pretty big limitation for this study. But the results were still interesting, right? Um, let, me re let me rephrase it right there. Sorry, no subjects in the sham group, I, I misspoke, excuse me. No subjects in the sham group were able to do more. Let me see if I... Put that right in there, there we go. Okay, yeah, sorry, there's another study where they didn't have the sham group. Um, this one did, and no subjects in the sham group were able to exceed their max reps, which I thought was just really fascinating. Um, those that were actually receiving the light 
uh, you know, on the biceps, were able to uh, exceed their initial rep counts following a 30-minute light treatment. Right? So um, again, no subjects exceeded their, their counts, uh, and a significant amount were able to do more after a 30-minute light treatment. So again, clearly the, the, the light, or we felt like the light is doing something. Um, I started off looking at 30 college-age students, and this was kind of interesting. This is um, where the study, the next thing I'm going to talk about, kind of originated from, is we actually looked at uh, imaging ultrasound. Uh, so, you know, again, diagnostic ultrasound, like somebody spoke about a couple days ago in one of the labs. Um, we actually looked at that because um, after we created the bruise, we wanted to see if there was any tissue healing. Um, we used visual analog pain scales. So basically, I would have my subjects um, perform just various exercises, squats, um, walking up and down stairs. Um, we did a hyperspectral image, which is actually a really neat camera um, that can determine uh, the pixel count uh, within certain, you know, within, within tissue to help us basically see if the bruise is being eliminated, right? Um, hyperspectral imaging is actually used in, in child abuse cases sometimes. They can actually um, take pictures and determine how long that bruise has been there based upon the pixel count of the bruise. So that's kind of what we started. But was, what was interesting is, um, our data was showing uh, some conclusions, right? But, but the fact that we were utilizing a, a visual analog scale, it wasn't clear enough, right? I mean, yes, we were seeing some things on, without question, we were seeing some things on the, uh, on the hyperspectral image and on the imaging ultrasound. We were seeing that the bruise was decreasing in, in nature and in size. Um, but we wanted to try to find something else that would look at actual performance recovery, right? I mean, again, the purpose of the studies that we're doing is exactly as it said right here, is to see if we can get muscle recovery, um, you know, following, you know, a, a, a thigh contusion uh, model. So from that study, I did some research and I, and I came up with using a biodex, right? Looking at um, um, uh, eccentric quad activity, and, and as opposed to just using a visual analog scale, actually looking at peak torque and average power um, with the Biodex machine. And so we um, basically um, repeated some portions of the study. We took 46 healthy subjects, 23 males, 23 females. They had five total visits. Sorry, I'm gonna check my time here. They had five total visits. Um, the first visit was simply just to establish a baseline. Uh, we chose 60 and 180 degrees per second for the isokinetic or the biodex machine, and that was, again, based upon lit review. Um, those are pretty standard. We actually started off trying it at 240, um, and nobody could get to 240. I mean, there was, there was very little, you know, there's hardly any resistance, right, at 240 degrees per second because it's very hard to actually get your leg to move that fast where you can actually have some type of resistance. So um, when we weren't getting good results at 240, I went and looked at the literature again, and I was like, oh, it's because most, most of these studies where they're measuring output is done at 60 and 180 degrees per second. So um, I know it sounds kind of barbaric, but yes, we actually hit students um, and people, volunteers, uh, with a tennis ball. These were college students, college-age students. Um, we hit them from about 12 inches away at, at approximately 80 miles per hour. We actually did use a pitch, or a, uh, not a pitching machine, but a tennis ball machine. Um, the uh, tennis uh, coach was kind enough to actually give me his old broken machine um, because it didn't swivel anymore, but it was great for us. Uh, because we could line it up perfectly, and, and we, were, we got really good at hitting exactly where we want within target. Okay? Um, I, I have uh, uh, I've actually hit myself three times. Um, I certainly wouldn't ask any of the students to do something that I wouldn't do. Um, and we, we would hit me when I was basically, we were kind of getting, trying to get perfected at hitting exactly where we wanted to hit. Right? So, so I was the guinea pig uh, to an extent. And I will say that it stings more than it actually hurts, but it is a perfect model uh, to creating bruise um, because it's, it's a repeatable, excuse me, um, it's safe uh, you know, relatively. I mean, you are whacking somebody in the leg, but, um, but it is, it, it again is the same, you know, um, consistent uh, force uh, with every single subject. So here, let me see if they play. So the one on the left there, this is my, or yeah, your left. It's right there. This is actually my nephew, who is a, who is a student at BYU, and you can kind of see his face. He's not the toughest guy in the world, but he's a good kid. Yeah, and there's the one on there. You see that one? Yeah, so that's, that's what we did, right? And, and it does sting a little bit, I won't lie to you, right? Um, so we, we did that uh, on day two, right? The first day was to establish the baseline. On day two, they came in and... Uh, um, 
Uh, we took some pre, what we call pre-injury, I hate using the term injury, but pre-contusion uh, pictures, um, and then we um, hit them uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the tennis ball. Uh, we then did um, a hyperspectral image and a regular you know, camera image again, and then we provided a treatment uh, for them. Uh, and it was just a standard 20-minute red, red, blue um, light patch treatment. Um, then following that, we took uh, pictures again with a hyperspectral image and a regular camera, and then we went and we did uh, the biodex, right? Um, so there's again a picture of that. The biodex protocol, like I said, we, we use 60 and 180 degrees per second. Um, so again, for those that, that you know, aren't, aren't you know, familiar, the biodex controls how fast you can go. You're not able to develop momentum. Um, and it's a way of really measuring um, torque and power throughout the full range of motion. So for a study like this where we're looking at muscle uh, ability to perform, it's great, right? I think it's a really, really good tool to use. Um, we did uh, five reps, uh, two sets, at, again, at both speeds, right? And then there was a 30-second rest period in between the first and the second set. Um, and when we did our averages, we averaged both of them together, right? We didn't just do, you know, first set um, results and second set. We, we basically just put in all the numbers, and, and that's what we, you know, how we ran our, uh, how we ran our ANOVA. Uh, again, we were looking at peak torque and average power. Um, uh, yes, uh, photos can be manipulated. I realize that. I still put it on here because um, one of the kind of the funny stories was uh, this, the subjects didn't know whether they were receiving light or not. Um, we basically uh, kind of shielded them so they could not see their leg as to whether they were getting light or not. Right? It doesn't vibrate. It doesn't buzz. Um, you know, there is a warmth component, but, you know, there not enough to where they can really tell, right? I mean, whether it's on there or not. Um, and we actually had to kind of change our methods. It was just based on luck of the draw. And I would schedule two people at a time, um, simply, you know, because I could handle two people at one time. We had to stop doing that because um, after, you know, one or two treatments, the, the people amongst themselves, if one of them was in the uh, placebo group and one of them was a treatment group, they were like, well, why is hit their bruise a lot less? And I said, well, everyone responds differently you know, to, to, the, to the treatments, but they're like, no, I'm, I'm getting the placebo, aren't I? And after that happened, like two or three times, they're like, okay, we can't do two subjects anymore because it's just, it's just too obvious. Um, you know, the bruise was, uh, uh, was essentially um, being eliminated after the light treatments, and it would come back, and obviously not eliminated, but decreased, I should say. Um, we found that the active uh, PBM treatment significantly aided in the function of recovery, recovery, excuse me, and peak torque, during the 180 degree test and average power in both the 60 and the 180 degree test. Um, at trial day four, the mean peak torque and average power of the 180 degrees um, um, group or the 180 degree um, uh, performance exceeded baseline levels by 8.9 and 16.8% respectively. So basically what we were seeing was people that were on day two starting to dip, right? So you get hit and, and usually the the result, uh, the output, the torque, the power was pretty similar to the baseline. But by day two, that, that bruise was setting in, right? And it was uncomfortable. And so on pretty much on every group, uh, whether it was sham or, uh, or excuse me, whether it was placebo or uh, um, PBM, we were seeing a dip. Um, but with the PBM groups, we started to see an elevation. And by day four, again, not only had they recovered completely, uh, but they had exceeded, most of them were exceeding what they did in their, um, uh, in their baseline test. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, we, we did red and blue light with this study. Um, I did four patients um, or uh, subjects uh, with blue light only. I was just curious, and so I did four subjects, and I didn't include them in here, right? And, I, and, I, and this is, I don't want to say it's anecdotal. I mean, I actually did it, but I didn't run stats on it, so I, you know, that's, um, we, we just kind of looked at the data. And what was interesting is um, with the blue light only, we saw recovery, right, compared to the, uh, to the placebo individuals, but we didn't see the excess, right? So it's like they were able to get back, but they weren't able to increase. And when you look at the difference between red and blue light, that made sense. Now, again, that was only four subjects, and I didn't include it in, in, the, in you know, the analysis with, with this study, but it shows me an area that I want to look at again is I want to just see um, you know, is that blue light great for the inflammatory response? And the red light is what is really helping provide that uh, mitochondrial increase, right, and power increase. And because in four subjects, that's what I saw. Um, again, basically the conclusions of the red and the blue photobiomodulation light patch aided in quicker recovery during the acute phase of the human thigh contusion injury model, um, allowing for faster increase in functional quadriceps strength and power. 
I do want to also mention what was interesting is when we just did the visual analog study, everyone, one of the reasons we stopped doing it is there was minimal variation, right? Everyone's like, I feel pretty good, I feel pretty good, yeah, it's okay. And everyone was around one or two. Um, but when we started to do something that was really looking at their output, that's when we saw the change, right? That's when we actually saw, hey, this is doing something, you know, they may not realize it, but they actually are, you know, 15 to 20 percent, or they we're seeing a 15 to 20 percent increase in what they're able to do um, if they utilize the, the PBM patch. So, uh, you know, basically, the, the question that we start thinking of and, you know, we start thinking, well, is this going to be effective? Is this something we can use now um, when somebody has an injury, uh, whether it be a chronic injury or an acute injury? Um, is this something that we can maybe utilize in a healthy population to try to increase mitochondrial activation? Right? And, and, and again, that, those are some of the studies that we're kind of um, looking at moving forward. Um, you know, I, I worked for baseball for a long time, and it's very interesting. One of the, um, I think it's a little bit because it is kind of vogue. When I say vogue, I mean it's because, well, so and so is doing it, so I'm going to do it, um, is the amount of players that are going away from icing um, when they didn't suffer an acute injury. Right? And I want to be very clear, I am not in any way advocating. Um, for using light as opposed to ice. I, I'm not whatsoever. Um, uh, what I am saying is that we are seeing, at least I did in my practice, um, more pitchers that said, hey, I didn't hurt anything. Why do I need to ice, right? I don't need to ice. There's nothing going wrong. And so, you know, they didn't like the feeling of ice. And if they didn't, you know, suffer any type of injury, why would they want to ice? Um, so I, you know, thought, well, I, I understand that. If you don't like ice, it's not fun. Um, but maybe putting a light patch on after you throw, uh, you know, might be another way to help with recovery that you don't necessarily perceive, right? Because, you know, yeah, your arm is sore, but you know it's sore every time you throw. You don't equate that to necessarily injury. So maybe putting on a light patch as opposed to ice you know, might be an option for you, right? To kind of assist in your recovery. So uh, again, um, you know, that's just kind of something, you know, that, that I've thought about, something that I, I kind of want to look at basically moving forward. Um, I do want to um, uh, mention uh, over the past two months, so I actually gave this uh, a, a version of this, pretty similar version of this presentation at the UATA symposium in uh, December. Well, since December, and one of the things I mentioned to them was the desire to look at ice uh, compared to light. Uh, now, I've only done some um, pilot work. I've only done six subjects where all we did was ice. Um, and we iced them just like we would in, you know, in regular practice. We hit them with the tennis ball. We took our pictures. Well, we, we came in. We did the baseline right on day one. We got their, their um, uh, peak torque and average power at 60 and 180 degrees. Then the next day they came in. We took our pre-contusion picture. We hit them. We took the post-contusion picture right after we hit them. And then we just applied an ice treatment for 20 minutes, right, the way that we would in, in regular practice. Um, and then after that, we went and we did their strength, uh, or we did their uh, isokinetic or their biodex um, uh, uh, performance. And then we did that on day two, day three, and day four. We only iced, though, after the first, you know, day, right, when, when they just got hit because we felt like that was typically what happens is, you know, you ice and then the next day, unless the bruise is really bad, um, a lot of people, you know, won't ice beyond that first day. And so that's what we did. Um, what was, I think I've got it right here. Oops, sorry. So, um, again, Pure pilot that, uh, 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 stuff here, right? That's, you know, uh, I'm not saying that this is, uh, you know, we, we need to do this with more subjects, obviously, but four out of the six subjects had a decrease in power and torque, um, but again, not as severe as the placebo group, right? So the ice was still working. Um, we still saw that dip, but I didn't see as much of a dip, right, in the power and the torque um, on the people that iced, and I think, again, that's just showing that ice works. It helps in recovery. It can help with acute injury, in this case, a contusion. Uh, it worked. Uh, two of the six subjects' data showed basically a return, right, to, to, the, to the regular power, but they didn't, none of them had an increase. The only time I saw an increase in peak torque and average power was when I utilized uh, the actual red and blue patch. Um, so again, this is just six subjects. We're going to continue to kind of move forward with this. Um, again, I, I was very... You know, when we, we were talking about, especially when I presented this in August, I was, or I mean in uh, December, excuse me, I was nervous about people thinking I'm going to sit up here and say ice isn't in good anymore. And, and I was nervous about that because I, I think there's absolutely is a place for ice when we have acute injury, without question. I mean, and it's more than just pain modulation. Um, and so I was kind of, you know, glad to see the results that I, that I got, right? It's like, okay, good. I, I do believe the ice is doing something. Um, I think there's a place for it. And then again, moving forward, maybe we apply ice and then we do red and blue light afterwards or something of that nature. 
So um, noticeable again was, and this is what I mentioned, was the lack of a significant drop from day one to day two. Um, in my placebo groups, I saw a pretty significant drop from day one and day two. Um, and I even saw a drop with my red and blue light folks. But with the ice, I didn't see as much of a drop. Like I said, I didn't see an increase, but again, clearly for me in those six subjects, um, the ice was, was doing something. And therefore, again, I, I think ice will, for me, always have a place in tissue recovery. So um, where do I go from here, right? I'm kind of excited about this. I, um, I'm sorry, I'm doing my time. I, uh, I, I, I'm one who has done uh, quite a bit with uh, ultrasound. Um, and you know, with ultrasound, we were able to change some of the parameters. Uh, I was not able to change any of the parameters or any of the joules or any of the output with the light, right? I was using the, you know, the, the whatever, 6.4 nanometers and 4.6, whatever the, the LED patches were. There's a, quite a range that you can use. I actually contacted um, Kara and said, why did you choose those ranges? And they said, that's based upon literature. That's what we saw, you know. Um, but there is some literature that, that talks about, again, varying the levels of the light, how it can, you know, um, obviously uh, increase or potentially decrease activation um, of the mitochondria as well as the inflammatory response. But, you know, the, the, the parameters they chose were, were what they had found in the literature as being uh, successful. So um, one of the studies that I've talked about doing uh, with one of our professors um, again, along with the ice uh, and, and kind of comparing ice with the light, is actually doing um, a, a tissue biopsy, right? Actually uh, uh, seeing, again, if we can see any mitochondrial changes under the microscope, um, you know, based upon light therapy. Now, I put on here, you know, I need to get uh, funding for that and then IRB approval, dot, 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 because when I, when I, I mean, the IRB was okay with me hitting people at the tennis ball. They were kind of questioning about it, but they're like, okay, so now I'm going to tell them, yeah, I'm going to hit them, and then I'm going to cut a piece of their muscle out. So I don't know, right? We'll see what they, we'll see what they say. Um, but I'm hoping that they let me do that because I really want to see, again, I, I, don't get me wrong, performance output is a great metric. I mean, it, I think the BioDix is a good metric to utilize, um, but I think seeing it under a microscope would, would be even more interesting and we're actually kind of seeing if we're seeing an increase in mitochondrial size. And, and, and so anyway, it's just one of the things I've talked to one of my um, colleagues about who's really good and, and does uh, muscle biopsies and such. Um, again, some other things, you know, just looking uh, at maybe uh, activating or, excuse me, utilizing a, uh, an active group that is injury free and simply having them utilize a light treatment maybe after a workout or maybe prior to a workout to see if they can, you know, feel like they can do more and then we can obviously measure that. You know, I think there's lots of areas where we can study this. And I mentioned, again, the, the, um, the concept, let me go to my next slide here. I mentioned the concept of ultrasound. Um, because again, with ultrasound, a lot of times it depends upon, I mean, the effectiveness of the ultrasound, not all ultrasound machines are created equally, we know that. It depends upon the BNR and, you know, the quality of the crystal. And, and with light, again, we don't see some of that variation. We might, again, within the parameters, um, but, you know, we, we, I don't know that we'll see a lot of variation again as long as the light is within a certain range, right? Because light is light. Um, but we don't necessarily know because, again, most of the studies and most of the work based upon light thus far um, has been on, on uh, 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 killing and disinfecting and germs and such and not necessarily application where we're looking at muscle performance and muscle output. So, you know, the, some of the studies that, that we've done with... Um, uh, with ultrasound, I'm kind of looking at trying to see, and I'm excited to see if I can kind of do some of those same things um, with different types of light machines, different, you know, companies, um, you know, seeing if there maybe is some of the variation like we certainly see and like I, you know, personally saw um, with some of my studies where I compared, you know, one type of ultrasound unit to another. Um, I want to conclude, I want to thank uh, uh, CareWare, uh, Dr. Uh, Chris and Don Castell. Um, Justin Rigby at University of Utah is a, a, a great resource for me. He's uh, significantly smarter than I am. He's really good at running stats, and, uh, uh, and so he helps me with my stats. Um, and this was um, uh, the last work with uh, uh, you know, one of the last studies that Dr. Dave Draper was able to perform. For those that don't know, Dr. Draper passed away last year um, uh, with COVID-related issues. Uh, and so, you know, he was my chair of my dissertation. He's somebody that, uh, without him, I, I absolutely would not be at BYU and, and probably, honestly, wouldn't even have my PhD. So it was a real honor for me to, um, uh, to be able to conclude um, you know, his life's work uh, with, with beginning this new area and this new chapter, um, you know, looking at light. And, and as I put on there, Dr. Draper, you know, he was a, a mentor and um, you know, he was a mentor to, to many of us, but he was a friend to, to really all of us. So um, you know, I, I, with a heavy heart, I say you know, it was a real honor for me to be able to, uh, to work with him um, in this final study.
All right, can I answer any, we made it to the end. Uh, can I answer any questions for, uh, for you? Does anyone have any questions at all? I don't know whether this is on, I can just yell. First of all, you guys have got to have the greatest IRB around. <laughs> a lot of us couldn't do anything like I that. I promise it was approved, but they did question it. They're, you know, oh, but they I'll can answer. question it, but I, when Ty, uh, Ty Hopkins did yeah. this study where he actually mimicked telephomoral pain syndrome, and you come up with this, I'm saying, holy <laughs> cow. Yeah, we can, we can beat up our kids pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do have two questions. One is, did you look at effect size, and then also did you a power analysis? Can you say that again? Did you look at effect size, and did you also uh, do any type of power analysis? Um, we did the power analysis, which is why we actually uh, did the number of subjects that we, that we did. That was one of the suggestions that Dr. Rigby had. We actually were trying to run our stats um, based upon some early numbers, and we um, did a power analysis to determine, make sure that our ANCOVA was going to give results. Yeah, so that's, why we, that's why we ended up with 46 subjects. Yep. And the effect size of the CSD, was effect size at all? Um, Honestly, not, not really, yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, let me make sure I'm answering your question. When you say effect size, can you, can you what do you mean by that? I just wanna, pardon? Show and see, or something similar to that, where you're looking to find out whether or not, but you may see a significant difference. The question is, is it clinically important and is it clinically meaningful? Yeah, so, so again, I, 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 yeah, and I, and I appreciate it. Sorry if that was ignorant of me. I just wanna make sure I understood what you were talking about. Um, again, we did run the we did run the power. We felt like we were confident with the numbers that we had. Um, you know, I think one of the things that again, as we look forward, as we move forward, um, we can continue to try to um, add more subjects, change some of the parameters, and not only just have a um, a, a true uh, sham group, but an actual true control group. Um, because one of the you know the issues that people have thought about when we're using this biodex machine is are they getting their strength increase as simply a result of training? If I go in and I do you know, five sets, excuse me, two sets, five reps at, at two different speeds, I'm going to get stronger. Um, that was one of the things that we saw, but that wouldn't explain for why one group had increases in their performance output. Um, so that was, you know, that, that was again, I, I think one of the things that spoke to us pretty well was looking and seeing that the one group actually did have an increase in output and their increase in, uh, in peak torque and average power um, if they had the red and blue light as opposed to those that did not. Any other questions at all? Well, I, I'm very appreciative again. Thank you so much for sticking around with, uh, for me. And look, we even ended a few minutes early. I hope that's okay. Um, again, everyone travel safe, and I really appreciate you paying attention. Thank you so much. Thank you.